to appear on it, then uh, you might want to uh, bear that in mind. So as I said, the theme uh, of the webinar uh, today is whether the EU and whether the EU UK relationship. And uh, our speakers, uh, who I'll introduce uh, uh, first, are, are David Gao. Uh, David Gao is the former European business editor of the Guardian. He was a papers German editor in Bonn from uh, for about 10 years. He was also the first EU correspondent with Scotsman in the 1970s. Uh, he's now a freelance journalist consultant based in Edinburgh. He's the editor of the Scottish website Skeptical Scott and he has a, a very long uh, record of involvement in journalism uh, 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 in many different uh, 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 forums over many years and we're delighted David is with us uh, this evening. And the second speaker will be Kirsty Hughes. Uh, Kirsty uh, is a researcher, writer and commentator on European politics and policy. She's worked at a number of leading European think tanks, Central European Policy Studies, Chatham House, Policy Studies, Policy Studies Institute and others and has again a very a long record of uh, contributing to European debate and of course in Scotland in particular she has been playing a very leading role in that as the director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations which she has been doing uh, since 2017. So uh, excellent uh, uh, couple of speakers uh, today. Uh, David's topic uh, uh, will be the subject of whether the EU, the EU of course has got a plan for recovery green recovery plan, how's that going, uh, how's the future uh, structure of you, EU going to look in the next few years. Uh, and then, they, uh, then Kirsty will be looking at the EU-UK relationship. And of course, part of that issue is also the question of Scotland's relationship uh, with the EU and how do the negotiations currently taking place, uh, apparently, um, have a bearing on the Scottish government's uh, own constitutional agenda as well. So those are the topics, those are our speakers, and I'll now hand over to David Gow for the first contribution. David. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you very much, Mark. That's very kind of you. And uh, as you say, it'd been a hack, yeah, for, uh, I'm afraid, half a century. But anyway, there we are. Hey, uh, still going strong. So, uh, a, a, as you say, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk, first of all, about the uh, EU and the, where it's going. And uh, Martin Wolf, who's the great sort of the FT's Financial Times' great venerable economics commentator uh, last month wrote, the EU was born out of catastrophe, which he's talking about the Second World War, of course, and Nazism, fascism, and has advanced through crisis. And, you know, that's a very common th narrative thread throughout the last 60 years of EU history. And even today, we're faced with the worst pandemic in a century and the gravest economic crisis in 90 years. Uh, the word on the Place Luxembourg is the EU will emerge stronger, forged in crisis. Or, well, as a variant, will muddle through as we always and come out stronger at the other end. So, how far is this true? Well, some critics, like my old mate Wolfgang Mücher, see the EU as just limping along from crisis to crisis. And in their eyes, that's been the case since at least 2008 and the financial crisis, or even before. Where the, in the 90s, we had the Balkan Civil War and the violent breakup of Yugoslavia, where the EU was pretty well paralyzed by inaction, not least because member states backed different sides. Germany, clearly Croatia, the UK, Serbia, for instance, and the aftermath of the 2008 banking crisis saw it morph into a sovereign debt crisis through bailout, the bank bailouts, and then a fully blown Eurozone crisis with the wrong neoliberal macroeconomic decision springing a decade of austerity. It's setting back the European cause enormously and the whole integration process enormously too. And the consequences of all this we're still living with today. So then in 2015, we had the, the refugee crisis as tens of thousands fled drought, famine, civil war in North Africa, the Middle East and further south. And we saw Germany welcome a million people, but others refused to lift a finger virtually with external and occasionally internal borders closed when intra-EU solidarity and far more solidarity with refugees 
was this required. And a year later, of course, the EU, the UK, sorry, as a whole, as a whole, voted narrowly in a deeply flawed referendum for Brexit. And this triggered some fears that other member states would follow suit. And that all and all of that in an atmosphere of heightened tension and dissension, especially over the rule of law in Poland and Hungary. And as we know, many of these issues remain far from resolved even as we speak. So the past decade has seen the ugly face of populism, nativism, racism, reborn in swathes of Europe, and not only there, of course. I mean, partly no, I think of America. Partly this has been a perhaps overdue reaction to the relentless march of untrammeled globalization, which has left behind millions of resentful and angry losers or victims in its economic wake, and a huge and growing inequality gap. But there's also been an evident demographic sovereignty deficit. People simply feel rolled over by the processes of change that governments have managed arbitrarily. And all the while, there's been a widespread feeling that Europe simply isn't working. Evidence at the start of this pandemic by yet more border closures, refusals to share PPE or export, urgently required medicines, and above all by leaving Italy, apparently, in the lurch, as it struggled to cope with clusters of the coronavirus in towns and cities such as Bergamo. But it's my contention, and not just mine, that the picture we see before us now is something quite different. Of course, there is continuing continuing, sorry, instability and tension, I wrote this all, all this down, and tension within the EU 27, but that's probably inevitable. I mean, the consequence of what, you know, rather one might lawfully say, Marx called the uneven development of capitalism, dialectic of history. A mighty Germany that's managed the pandemic exceptionally well, but it's, it too faces enormous tasks in future, a decaying de infrastructure, Half the bridges in Germany are unpassable. Obsolete industry sectors, including the car industry, failure to embrace digitalization swiftly, as anybody will know if they've had to deal with the German bureaucracy. But a politically divided, say, economically weakened Spain, or illiberal anti-democratic abuses of power by Viktor Orban in Hungary, or who knows, France, qui sait, may be at war with itself in the 2022 elections. We are where we are, but the EU is, in my view, in better shape than it was a few years ago. The threat posed by the far right has been contained, with the AfD, the Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, down to around about 10% support. Sal Matteo Salvini's La Lega in Italy, splattering with impotent rage from the sidelines, and Conti, not the, not, the, not the football manager, the other one, the prime minister, looking pretty good. And polls showing Marine Le Pen would lose again to Macron in 22 months' time. Even the left will hold its nose and the liberals will hold their nose and vote for Macron, even though he's a flawed, seriously flawed individual. And certainly as president, I mean. And the EU27, despite the wildest fantasies of Messrs Johnson, Gove and Cummings, has more than survived their crude attempts to divide and rule, it's seen them off, displaying strong unity throughout the often nasty Brexit process. And generally speaking, the EU commands more popular support than before Brexit. And critically, especially under two German women, Ursula von der Leyen and Angela Merkel, the EU is adopting measures driven by a renewed sense of solidarity when it comes to dealing with the pandemic as such, and with its economic impact. Germany took over the presidency of the EU Council of Ministers on July 1, and in the run-up signalled a change of course that should, we hope, come to fruition or be endorsed at the July 18-19 summit, uh, I believe the first scheduled face-to-face -face European Council for months. And during lockdown and dehibernation, von der Leyen has been spearheading moves to coordinate EU responses to the pandemic, sharing PPE, above all, helping to set up the CV19 accelerator that is driving cross-country, cross-company R&D into new therapeutics, treatments and vaccines, and pan-European efforts to procure and share equitably novel vaccines proven in clinical trials and winning regulatory approval in record time.
the idea being to get it done all in 12 months rather than the usual 12 years. This must be a good thing. Even the UK government is vaguely interested. The pandemic, and it's been absolutely deliberately, uh, quite atrociously anti-European for the sake of it. The pandemic has spurred proposals for a 9.4 billion euro standalone health fund from Health Union, if you prefer, to work on an EU27 basis. Normally, public health, of course, and traditionally, has been the preserve of national governments. And there's still quite a lot to go there. Brussels watchers always invest a huge lot of expectations in council presidencies when the bigger countries take over. But the new German one is raising even greater hopes than usual about outcomes over the next six months. Not least because Merkel, Frau Merkel herself, has nothing to lose. She's standing down as chancellor sometime between now and next year's elections. The Germans are running the show in the phrase of the economist. Trump. And via reboot of the old Franco-German locomotive, locomotive of European integration, think the goal, Adenau, 1963, Schmidt Giscard, Mitterrand Kohl, she and Macron have signaled a substantial change of course in EU economic thinking. This is what Mark referred to the EU recovery plan or fund known as Next Generation EU. That goes way beyond anything contemplated comparatively by the UK. I mean, this may not be the much trumpeted Hamiltonian moment after, you know, Alexander Hamilton, the uh, US Treasury Secretary, who uh, introduced debt neutralization, but it certainly gives the light to the opera claim Minsky moment, which is the moment when everything comes, a crash, a, a market-led crash or collapse happens. And although, of course, the Commission is now forecasting, we saw today, an 8.4% hit to EU GDP this year before recovering to growth of 5.8% in 2021. And amongst that, Italy, Spain, Croatia, and France will suffer around 11% damage this year, much the same as the UK. So I have an old Social Europe colleague, Andrew Watt, who's head of European policy at the Institute of Macroeconomics in Dusseldorf, puts it, a few months ago, no one would seriously forecast that a proposal with such features would be on the table. The von der Leyen Fund, now being negotiated by the European Council President Charles Michel, is worth Euro 750 billion, or half as much again as the scheme first presented by Merkel and Macron earlier this year. And of this, 438 billion euros will be grants to individual member states most damaged by the pandemic with Italy in first place. The rest in guarantees, 60 billion, and loans, 250 billion. Though Brussels admits a quarter, maybe at most, may will be spent in the next two crucial years. And obviously that means big work has got to be done by the, uh, by the summit uh, the week after next. And the monies behind this fund will, for the first time, be raised by borrowing on the markets via the latest 1 trillion euro EU budget, also technically known as the seven year multi-annual financial framework, oh my God, also due to be approved, I hope, in 10 years, in 10 days, not 10 years, 10 days time or later this summer. The breakthrough here is that Germany, which I remember it well, only too well, I was reporting out of Brussels at the time, crushed debt mutualization and other very proactive measures of, uh, to our economic solidarity a decade ago, has conceded that new debt can not only be borrowed, but outdone so on a shared or mutual basis. Uh, debt repayments, moreover, will not take place immediately, as debt servicing can take place much, much later down the tracks. So as Merkel herself has said, the EU has been met with the most difficult situation in its history. And exceptional times demand exceptional measures. Germany, and not least Germans, now seem to accept that it too, their country, will suffer if its neighbours are on their knees. As you might put it in German, es lohnt sich Solidarität. The obsession with a black balanced budget, the great, the huge, terrible error of the last decade, the black zero, the schwarze null, the balanced budget, has been temporarily, we hope, of not permanently laid to rest. 
despite the machinations of the German Constitutional Court. Talk about overreach. Of course, there's many a slip to its cup and lip, and it would appear that the package, subject to, as we say in Brussels speak, modalities, negotiated between now and then, will be appro will win approval. Already, the usual suspects, including the new Hanseatic legal proponents of fiscal rectitude, have been reduced to the frugal four, or the very disparate Austria, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden, with the latter two in the hands of social democratic governments, the first centre-right and the Dutch liberal-led. We may not, we may not be headed yet for a repeat of the Trump Glorieuse, the period 1945 to 1975, the great three post-war decades of Keynesian growth and, and, and shared, shared, relatively shared, you know, prosperity. But the neoliberals are at last in retreat. They should, even in Brussels, there should be no repeat of the austerity debacle, we hope, of the past decade in this post-pandemic era, assuming there is one. There is serious talk of a more social Europe, of action for both guaranteed minimum incomes across the EU27, measures to end in-work poverty, and to boost the youth guarantee of a job, apprenticeship or traineeship, taught admittedly so far. Some critics suggest that, as in 2012, the EU's over-reliant on the extraordinary measures undertaken by the European Central Bank, which doesn't just affect the 19 strong Eurozone, but goes way beyond Europe's borders. So far, in its special bone buying programmes, the ECB has committed, this time round, almost 1.5 trillion euros, or a quarter of EU GDP. There are other support measures coming via the European Stability Mechanism, but what different this time is that whereas in the wake of the financial crisis, it was the ECB that undertook to do whatever it takes to save the euro and keep the EU show on the road, Mario Draghi in 2012. This time it's the EU 27 and its leaders. There's a palpable awareness in Brussels and other European capitals that as the Spiegel columnist put it recently, if Italy, Spain or France go down the tubes, perhaps because their people vote in far right and incompetent, untrustworthy, etc. governments, the single market, common currency and beneficiary countries such as Germany, which has done extremely well at the, both the euro and the single market, will go down the tubes with them too. So finally, in a world dominated by the potentially or actually ruinous trade war, and hegemonic battle between Trump's America and Xi's China, with Russia sniping from the sides, the EU is asserting a more values-based, shared sovereignty and solidarity globally. This contrasts with these anglospheric delusions of Johnson et al. We're here talking about decarbonisation, Green New Deal, development aid, but also joint investments in goods and services as different as vaccines, lithium batteries, AI, electricity grids, pan-European rail networks, renewable energy, or digital sovereignty, with the clear aim of taking on the US Chinese big tech, both fiscally and industrially. And perhaps we'll see some tangible fruits at the postponed COP26 in Glasgow next year. Of course, none of this is going to be plain sailing. And the EU, in my mind, and then that of a lot of others, needs to go a hell of a lot further in terms of a fiscal union with a European monetary fund or treasury, a Eurozone finance minister and longer term debt sharing, or within a more openly federal structure, with the European Parliament, national governments, as well as devolved administrations, assert greater democratic control, not least over economic policy. Europe needs a much more evenly balanced economy with a South no longer played off against the North and, and the rest of it. And as the Centeno, Mario Centeno, the, the departing European Group chairman has said to, today, what's important on the fiscal front for Europe in the coming months and years is the way we engineer the process of return to the application of the fiscal rules in a way that avoids prompting a recession. So keep the current relaxation of the Maastricht uh, deficit debt criteria, keep, it, keep them going. Uh, 
no return to austerity. And so for Scotland and the UK, this outcome would represent, in my mind, an historic opportunity and prospect, helping to shape a modern Europe, a revitalized, rebooted Europe, built on shared sovereignty and democratic solidarity, really taking control. Over to you, Kirsty. Thanks, David. Um, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And thanks, David, for, the, for that great kind of, not just great overview, but through time, through time as well. Um, sadly, my talk um, is really on the state of the, the Brexit, or you might call them the post-Brexit negotiations, um, since, as you know, we already left the European Union on the 31st of January this year. Um, so I want to say something about the state of those talks, um, where they may go, uh, if anywhere, or whether they may go to a, a no deal, something we were also talking about a year ago, obviously, and now it's come full circle and we're weighing the odds of that again. Um, and time allowing, I may say something very brief at the end, as, as Mark suggested, about the implications for the Scotland's constitutional debate. Um, Anybody who, who was taking a look at social media earlier might have seen pictures of Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator and his team on the Eurostar on their way to London, all, all wearing masks. Um, last week was the first face-to-face -face meetings um, since March because of the COVID crisis and they were in Brussels last week, so they're in London this week. This is the supposedly intensified, speeded up, set of talks that, that came out of uh, a video meeting at the end of June between von der Leyen and Boris Johnson, um, which, which was very much needed um, in the sense that if, if I'm trying to summarize briefly how, how the talks have gone since, since March, the answer is, well, they've gone badly. They have really gone in circles if, if they've gone anywhere. Um, and time, time is obviously running on. So, so there comes a point, um, and may come a point more than once in such talks, where you need that sort of political intervention rather than simply leaving, leaving it to the two chief negotiators on each side. Um, having said that, uh, the, the talks in Brussels last week, after that supposed impetus from Johnson and von der Leyen, don't also seem to have made much progress. There was a couple of extra slots last Thursday reserved for sort of unspecified issues in case progress had been made in a particular way and they wanted to talk on particular issues some more and they didn't use those extra slots. And Michel Barnier in his post talks press conference made it clear that once again, not only that he was rather disappointed, but he, he made some rather blunt comments, and I mean, he's always polite, but he's becoming increasingly forthright, I'd say, in, in his comments, suggesting that while the EU was showing it, it was ready to compromise, that he didn't feel he was getting respect from the UK or recognition of what, what the big issues were for the European Union. Um, so the mood music is still not great. Uh, tonight, um, David Frost, the UK's chief negotiator as well as its um, imminent national security advisor um, in the politicization and presidentialization of our politics um, is having an informal dinner with Michel Barnier and uh, the menu has already been leaked so you, I'm sure you can find that on Twitter and elsewhere. Whether, whether that sort of informal discussion can nudge things along, um, we'll see. A lot, a lot of people since the start of the talk so said it's very difficult trying to do talks on, on video because a, a lot of the movement can often come from informal chats in the corridors over coffee, a sort of informal testing out of, well, if I give one thing, what will you give in return? So we'll, we'll see if things start to move forward, but, but time, time is running on. As you know, a week ago, it was the 30th of June, Tuesday the 30th of June, and as expected, sadly, the UK government and Boris Johnson, despite the lack of progress in the talks and despite the huge economic damage and uncertainty created by the COVID crisis and, and the political and health uncertainty, refused to ask for an extension of transition by the deadline. So that means that we will leave, with or without a deal, we will leave the EU's single market and customs union by the end of December. 
Um, there was there was one other rather interesting bit of news you might have noticed BBC Northern Ireland news today um, ab about the the border that is effectively being put in the Irish Sea between Britain and Northern Ireland as a, as a result of the withdrawal agreement last year, um, which which as I'm sure everybody listening on this webinar knows, um, basically kept Northern Ireland in the EU's single market for goods and in its customs union in order to keep the Irish border open. Uh, what was very interesting about that, I'm just, I'm just going to read one sentence that I, I wrote down from the story. It says, the UK government has submitted its application to the European Union to create border control posts at Northern Ireland's ports. Now this is, this is fascinating, isn't it? One, this is what you'd expect. That's the implications of the withdrawal agreement that Boris Johnson agreed last November with the European Union, before even before the general election in December. Um, but it doesn't exactly sound like taking back control, does it? It's not only that border posts are going up within the UK's own market, but the UK government is sending an application to the EU about it. Um, on top of that, ra rather farcical, if not humiliating outcome, then of course, if you put borders up and barriers up like that, you're going to find there are economic costs, which certainly businesses in Northern Ireland and in Britain that trade into Northern Ireland have been very worried about. And last but not least, even if it's not so surprising, it's also the opposite to what Boris Johnson said, because of course he said there wasn't going to be any border controls um, between Britain and Northern Ireland. I think in the context of the current talks, looking for the final shape of the future UK-EU relationship, it's worth thinking about all that. Because first of all, if you remember, as I said earlier, a year ago, we were wondering whether there was going to be no deal. And at the time, I was one of the people, there's quite a few people who thought no deal was the most likely outcome. And certainly things look pretty, pretty gloomy at some points. But I always thought a deal was more likely than no deal. There may be some part of the Tory Brexiters and backbenchers who want no deal, but actually there is quite a junk, chunk of them who, who see that there are benefits of some sort of basic framework and basic deal, and that gave us the withdrawal agreement. And then people started worrying that Boris Johnson might renege on that deal. Um, he's certainly gone back on, on what was agreed in the non-binding political declaration, as Michel Barnier has reminded us. But of course, this application to create these border posts has apparently gone in. So I think amidst all, all the political and economic damage of, of Brexit, that's actually relatively good news. There is a, a withdrawal agreement between the UK and EU. And for the moment, the UK, if a bit slowly uh, uh, and, and not in a timely way for business or for its relations with the EU, is actually implementing it. And I think when we then turn to, so where are the current UK EU talks going and are we going to end up with no deal? I can't give you a definitive answer to that any more than anybody else can. Um, but I, I still think there is a, a preference on both sides, not only on the European Union side, for a deal, though certainly on both sides, not for a deal at any cost. So we're facing still a fairly high probability of no deal, but I probably put a, a probability of, of having some sort of rather basic deal ahead, ahead of no deal. But it, it's, it's very shocking, um, both in, in terms of the economic and wider costs of no deal, but again, in, in the context of the COVID crisis, that we're even having to talk about the option of no deal again, that the UK government and civil service, the Scottish government and civil service, Welsh, Northern Ireland, are all having to prepare for that. Um, businesses and universities and charities and other organizations are not only having to see how they can survive and manage in, in, in the unfolding COVID crisis, they're also having to, to prepare in a rather uncertain way for the, the big event at the end of this year of the UK leaving, or at least Britain leaving, not Northern Ireland leaving, uh, the customs union and the EU's single market. Northern Ireland will leave just part of the single market. Um, 
In terms of the details of the talks, or, or not so much the details, but some of the big areas of disagreement, it, it's striking and it it's Ill, illustrates again the lack of progress, that the four biggest problematic areas, if you talk to anyone in Brussels today or you listen to Michel Barnier in public, are the same as they were at the end of March or, or the start of April. So there's a problem about fisheries, there's a problem about the so-called level playing field and whether the, the UK government will sign up to say it won't undercut future EU environmental and social and labour and climate change standards and, and very importantly competition and state aid standards. Um, there, there is a number of problems around the area of, of police cooperation and, and access to European security and police databases. And lastly, there's also a bit of a standoff on, on the question of dispute settlement once you've got a deal. How do, you, how do you manage, how do you govern the governance of the whole deal? And it's, it's quite telling to see that the difference there is basically that the EU wants one overarching, clear governance and dispute settlement outcome. And the UK wants potentially a series of smaller agreements on different issues, and they each have their own governance arrangements. And I think what that reflects, I, I'm, I'm starting to think in terms of the, it's hard to see really what the goals of the UK government are, perhaps in general at the moment, let alone in terms of the future UK-EU relationship. It's very ideological. Um, but I think this mantra of take back control has, has so sunk into the ideology and the directions to the UK negotiators that, that there's an antipathy to almost any sort of international agreement. I mean, we, we live in a, an international world and we need international agreements that, and you won't get a UK-EU deal unless it's in the interests of both sides. But I think there's an there's a almost built-in antipathy there from the UK side. So, so people I've talked to tell me things like, well, we think we're making progress on, say, some of the level playing field issues, but then the, the UK negotiators are clearly reminded of the political point that we mustn't follow EU laws, and, and so any progress is, is removed, um, and, and they're left with sort of vague reassurances that, of course, Britain won't cut standards. Obviously, just a vague reassurance is not going to be enough for EU negotiators. So I think for all these big issues, we could, I could talk for hours about them, but I won't because I'm, I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, for all these big issues, fish, level playing field, police cooperation and governance, there are compromises. And Michel Barnier had started to talk about in very broad terms poss possible compromises on fish and on level playing field issues last week, but he clearly felt he didn't get the sort of response he needed from the UK side. And the UK side clearly needs to move quite a bit to get into the detail to offer compromises too. If it does, we'll get to a deal. Um, it won't be a great deal. It will be a deal that puts customs procedures and barriers in the way of trade between the UK and the EU, especially in services, but also in goods. Um, it, it will damage our, our economy, it, it will damage things like, well, as you know, free movement will no longer exist. Um, and it will be an, an abrupt shock, but it won't be as big a shock as, as with a no deal outcome. I think the other, the other big challenge here is whether it's a deal or a no deal, we're not going to probably know that till the end of October. So at the moment, the deadline to try and agree a deal is the end of October to give it time to be ratified in the European Parliament in November to then come into place in January next year. Well, that's a very rapid timetable, not just for a deal, but for organizations and individuals to adjust to that new information. That would be extremely hard in normal circumstances. And obviously in the COVID, 19 crisis were not remotely in normal circumstances. So I think this looks, this looks difficult, it looks highly problematic and it looks damaging, but it, it is still possible at least that we get to this sort of basic deal. 
last sentence, because I'm out of time, um, last sentence on the constitutional side, in, in terms of the Scottish debate, if Scotland was to choose and to find a path to be allowed a choice, independence in the European Union, and if on the other hand, the UK has agreed a rather basic free trade deal with the EU, then there is going to be some sort of customs and regulatory border between Scotland and the rest of the UK. It will be different between Scotland and England and Wales on the one hand and Scotland and Northern Ireland on the other hand because the, the withdrawal agreement has already created this kind of patchwork uh, set up across the UK anyway. But that issue that an independent Scotland in the EU would have the one of the EU's external borders, land border, with England is one that I do think needs a lot more attention and that might be easier to get that attention um, even when we actually see the detail of that free trade deal if it comes in October. So I can, I can sort of virtually long distance see Mark looking at me so I'm going to leave it there and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you much indeed, Kirsty. Thank you, David. Uh, we do have a, a reasonable range of questions. Uh, I hope we can get through all of them. But can I just say that uh, if you look at your Q&A function, you'll see there, if you want to uh, uh, indicate your preference for a particular question to be answered, if there's an uptick facility on the left of the question, you see there's a thumbs up uh, icon. If you press on that, it'll then show if there's a, a lot of people who want to have a question in particular answered. Now, there's quite a few questions coming in. I'm going to try and get through them all. Um, I'm going to moderate them and hand them to talk to uh, Henry, to Kesti and to David to respond to. Uh, I won't necessarily go through all that they've been sent in, so don't worry if your question is answered straight away. We'll hopefully come to it in due course. Uh, the first question which uh, uh, um, I want to uh, do is a question which uh, uh, I think is probably one for both David and Kirsty. Will an EU27, which appears to be energised by the latest crisis, uh, but which has enough already on its plate, ever contemplate the return of a prodigal UK or even of one of constituent parts of the UK? David, Kirsty, what do you? David, perhaps first. What do you? What do you say to that? <laughs> Well, I think there's a, uh, well, Kirsty's already explained, you know, the, uh, well, some of the background in the talks between uh, Frosty, as we apparently call him, and, and Michel Barnier. Um, a, I have to say that my, my, my view is that there is extreme, there's very little appetite in Brussels to readmit the UK. I mean, on, on, and, and, you know, this is not a kind of like an immediate, if there was a change of government, which is going to be pretty surprising in, in 2024, which would be the first normal time, uh, and assuming that would be a Labour a Labour led government, uh, and that Labour could win a, to get a majority in these 123 seat uh, gains, um, but even so, I, I wanted to go ahead with it. You know, I, I I don't see the. I mean, people are very regretful. I mean, there's no doubt about it despite all the difficulties we created, and it was astonishing, the number of times the reporting out of Brussels, which was really about people throwing up their heads, you know, went private about the kind of silly behavior of, of the Brits, you know, uh, and so on. So I don't think there's gonna be any great appetite at all. Um, I, as regards Scotland, there is clearly much more of a kind of a, a, a welcome, but I don't think it's anything more than a virtual level at the moment. It's not. There is no real prospect of, of uh, first of all, Scottish independence within the next few, within the next couple of years, and second, you know, we can't see necessarily further down the tracks of any um, any genuine application being put in to uh, become to replace the UK as the EU twenty eighth member. Kirsty, um, yeah, I agree with what David said on on the UK side. Um, People were a mixture of disappointed, upset, um, uh, angry, and many other things at the Brexit vote. And I, I think since that moment four years ago, they've uh, they've watched with increasing concern and, and worry at the state of UK politics. And a, a lot of them sort of identified 
English identity and a debate around English nationalism as at the heart of that. So I think the EU would be very reluctant in the near future to, to welcome a penitent UK back. It would have to be more than penitent. It would have to be one that had clearly worked through all, all its political, democratic, constitutional problems um, and come out the other side of that. And I, I mean, who, who knows if, uh, as David says, in 2024, that seems quite a short time horizon, sadly, given current political trends. I, I may be wrong on that. Um, we, we live in fast moving times. Um, on the Scottish side, I think there is complete openness if Scotland was to vote yes in a constitutionally and legally valid referendum, there is complete openness to welcoming another small Northern European country into the European Union. Um, not so, obviously, and this would be a topic for a whole other webinar, not so if there's a big standoff over a, a referendum between London and Edinburgh. But I think it's not only that Scotland is seen as, as pro-European, given its Remain vote, its politics looks more normal at the moment. And, and frankly, any big country applying to join the EU, whether it's Turkey or, or Ukraine or the UK, is always much more problematic, usually, than a smaller, smaller country. So, so I think it, it is two different questions. Kirsty, one, I think, probably more for you. Uh, how disadvantaged is Scotland by Northern Ireland's new status. And perhaps linked to that, there's also a comment, I think at least all these customs posts will mean lots of jobs, so which you can uh, comment on or if you wish, but uh, Northern Ireland in particular, how might that be, uh, affect Scotland um, in a disadvantage? I, I've never been so concerned about that. It is something I know that has come up. Members of the Scottish government have said that. Periodically, I think people have expressed concerns that maybe foreign direct investment will go to Northern Ireland that would, would have gone perhaps to Scotland. Um, but firstly, we have to remember Northern Ireland is only in the EU's single market for goods, also in its customs union, it's, it's very important, but it's not in the single market for services. And, and the modern, modern services and goods are often produced together. The supply chains you get across the EU are, are integrated. So it, it's not obvious to me that Northern Ireland is necessarily going to be that much more attractive for, for foreign investment, but perhaps a bit. But I think for Scotland, the, the real disadvantage for Scotland is, is as for the rest of the Britain, is the damage of Brexit. You know, if, if you look at the fall in growth that's happened relatively already and if you look at the predictions by UK and Scottish government and by independent economists of the economic hit it's much larger and more important than the particular deal that Northern Ireland got which is obviously an extremely important one in, in terms of underpinning the, the peace process and there are costs to Northern Ireland and this comes back to what I was saying about the Scottish English border in the case of independence you know if you listen to the Northern Ireland Manufacturing Association for instance you've been very vocal on this there are significant costs and, and problems as, as well as benefits of that deal. Can I just say, David, yeah. I just add the, uh, a couple of things what is what is the a for Scotland I mean the issue is going to be the, if there's any delay, I mean, there's obviously going to be a delay to reaching, if, we, if we're in favour of it, to reaching independence. Then there'll be a delay about any negotiation. So the, the key question then is how, how, how much divergence will have taken place between, say, you know, between the Scottish way of doing things or the UK way of doing things and the EU way of doing things, bearing in mind what I've just talked about in terms of you know, the progress they, they want to do in terms of integration. The other thing is that often talked about up here is there's a kind of an assumption, I think, that the, uh, the Northern Ireland may also have a big, a, a certain kind of moral or otherwise political advantage in the sense that perhaps a united Ireland is closer down the tracks than a, than a uh, actually, you know, a border pole is closer down the tracks than, than you know, than, than Scottish independence itself. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. You know, but I mean, it's certainly a, it's it's certainly something worth bearing in mind. So here's a question which uh, uh, again looks at a different aspect of differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Question: In which area of policy do you expect the biggest political fallout 
in the UK and in Scotland in particular. I presume that means in the negotiations and the outcome of the uh, future relationship discussions. Possibly Kirsty first and then maybe David, if you want. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, <laughs> the biggest fallout. Uh, I think it's very hard to say. I mean, I think today also, you know, it, fe it feels like these talks are stuck and yet it, there's something new every day. And today you had the Luxembourg Prime Minister warning the UK that if it, if it wasn't showing more openness uh, to, to compromise and, and to having some connection to some EU rules, it, the UK was going to have big problems in, in, in getting so-called equivalents for the financial services sector. So. If there's a the equivalence, which isn't the same as having full access as, as we have now, that 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 would ease the impact on that sector. If there isn't a deal in that sector, then then that will be where there's fallout. I, I think from from I think the services sector is is another in general uh, a big one. Um, it's it's a big chunk of of the UK economy. It's where we actually have a positive net trade balance with with the European Union and and most modern trade deals do not give a great deal of access to services. So I think in general, the services sector is, is also going to be particularly badly hit. I think for Scotland, um, some of the constitutional issues around devolution are obviously very, very worrying. Um, the Scottish government wants as far as possible to stay close to or in line with EU regulations on in environment. Um, but but the, the UK government seems to be looking at, at potentially yet a, another power grab on that. So, so I think, you know, how the devolved powers work vis-a-vis -vis the fact that trade deals are reserved and negotiated at UK level is, is going to be, and this attempt to create um, common frameworks uh, has been the jargon around for a while, common frameworks and then divergence potentially in the devolved governments is is going to be a, a, a real challenge. David, you want to say anything? Well, yeah, on that last point, I think that's absolutely crucial. I mean, the, uh, the current kind of, you know, uh, relations between the centre, as it were, between Westminster and, and, the, and the three other nations, uh, Northern Ireland, a, uh, Wales and, and Scotland, are clearly broken down. I mean, the Joint Ministerial Committee is just a husk doesn't mean anything. It's complete rubbish. Uh, there's no negotiation. The, 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 the devolved administrations were supposed to be having some kind of impact on these, on these negotiations uh, on the future UK-EU relationship. Well, they've had zero impact on it because they haven't been consulted. They're not even told what's going on, seems to me. So that, and, it, and if indeed, as Kirsty says, they'll fear about the, about, the, about the common framework. I mean, there's plenty of evidence seems to be that this is a very centralizing government in Westminster, that it wants to grab all control and that the kind of gains made in terms of uh, the environment and elsewhere, agriculture and so on and so forth, but not just those, every, other things we wish to, you know, which there's quite clearly a political divergence between what the, uh, the current uh, conservative led government in the UK wants to do and what the current SNP led government in Scotland wants to do. And that is, it really seems to me pretty obvious. That will be repeated post Holyrood 2021. Um, so I think this is absolutely a crucial issue. And this is going to really poison relations between, between Scotland and, uh, and well, UK, and certainly, but certainly between Scotland and England. And the fallout, well, we'll just have to wait and see, but it will not be very pleasant necessarily. Well, perhaps that leads into uh, a question which uh, uh, is, not, is quite high on the list here, which is uh, a recent poll show increased support for Scottish independence, perhaps in part due to pro EU supporters pulling from, shifting from no to yes. Might this push for UK government towards a softer Brexit in order to bolster support for the union? Now, I'm going to, from the chair, say I don't think it will at all because I think the UK government is. Uh, uh, shows no indication that's going to influence his decisions uh, on, on the way it approaches York. And I'll see if David or Kirsty wants to say anything about that. But also it leads into a, another a question below that is, what difference, if any, would the election of a multilateralist US president in November make? Because that might perhaps have more influence on the uh, outcome of the UK government's thinking than perhaps, regrettably, what it might think about Scotland. Uh, Kirsty. Um. 
yes, I think I think on the first one, um, growing support for independence, no, is not going to lead at, the, at this stage to a softer Brexit. Um, I think I think we saw with Theresa May um, a, comp a quite extraordinary, really, if you think about it, quite extraordinary unwillingness to try and find any ways to bring the two remote remain voting parts of the UK, Northern Ireland and Scotland, somehow along with Brexit. Um, it just it just didn't happen. So the, the Joint Ministerial Committee EU negotiations was set up, as David just, just said. It was meant to try and create a common UK approach. Um, and so this was happening before the Boris Gov Johnson government took over. I, I think the difference since he took over is, is a more aggressive form of what Theresa May was already doing. It's a more aggressive centralization. It's more angry language. Um, you know, if a, if a UK government that was intent on Brexit was, was trying to, to ease some of the divisions in the UK, would it have so rapidly within a few hours dismissed a serious proposition from the Scottish government on devolving a chunk of migration policy? So mm. it could have happened, but no, it's not happening. Um, maybe I'll leave the US question to David. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Well, certainly I think a, a well, certainly a, uh, you know, a Joe Biden, for example, in other words, in, in, in the White House uh, as of January of next year, uh, would have a significant, would probably, hopefully, lead to a significant improvement in relations with, uh, necessarily with Europe as a whole, with the EU. Uh, whether it would improve the, you know, uh, well, it, and it probably would actually probably lead to some kind of improvement in terms of NATO. Who knows? Uh, quite. Like, I mean, there is a sense, but 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 actually, in a way, the the kind of detachment, the American detachment from. Uh, from Europe was already uh, was already occurred in the eight years of the Obama administration, uh, you know, with a pivot, as we now say, to to Asia. And I think, at a large extent, that will continue because the real issue for the Americans is not, you know, there's a marginal bit about Trump sort of taking troops out of out of Germany and putting them into Poland, things like that. But basically, the real thing, the thing they're obsessed with, and it doesn't matter who's in the White House, is China. And the hegemonic, uh, you know, uh, ambition of China to dominate vast sections of the world. I mean, you can see it like last night in the press conference, which the Chinese ambassador to the UK gave about Huawei and Hong Kong. And I mean, you know, there, there is two, at the moment, there are two great bullets squaring up to each other. I mean, they're without doubt, I mean, quite crude. And um, so I, don't, I think... Um, you know, uh, Biden will be more mellifluous towards Europe and probably towards NATO, but that's about as far as it goes. The real issue for them is China. Thanks. Now, a couple of uh, different uh, uh, types of questions. A question asking, this one is uh, directed at the European movement in Scotland. Uh, will we be uh, asking candidates for the next year's Scottish Parliament elections where they stand on Scotland staying in the EU single market after Brexit? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we'll be uh, asking or campaigning on in the next year's uh, elections, but we'll certainly be wanting to put the uh, agenda for having Scotland as close as possible uh, to the EU on the agenda uh, um, uh, for those elections, and that is certainly looks one of the things which I think we'll certainly be looking at. I mean, I, I mean, we want we want to see uh, rejoining the EU. That's our ultimate objective. But in, in the meantime, we certainly want to see as close as possible relationship that we can have. Um, uh, whether that's at Scottish or UK level or both, and obviously that maybe depends upon people's views, but we certainly will be campaigning on that, uh, and we will certainly, uh, without giving up on the uh, ultimate objective, we're certainly wanting to make sure Scotland and the UK as a whole are as close as possible uh, to the uh, EU, and we certainly want to campaign for that's what we do a lot of our, well, most of the time. Uh, that's, I think, probably answered that question. Uh, a question um, about um, what do, where, where do we stand on the issue of passporting? Uh, are the EU holding back uh, unless the UK agree uh, to a reasonable solution in the eyes of the EU? There'll be no passporting. Kirsty, I suspect, probably. Sorry, um, passporting in, term, 
in terms of what are we talking about um migration and travel or are we talking about financial services if a question doesn't say that uh i financial services it, financial service would i come to mind but uh, not i don't mean passports but financial services <laughs> i imagine it. what's it what's the idea i think um, i'm not i'm not sure i have much to add to what i what i said um earlier when i was referencing the the luxembourg prime minister um today in the sense of um it seems to have been accepted that, that rather than the sort of closer relationship that, that I think was talked about a year or two back in terms of passporting. The discussion has now moved on to so-called equivalence. The, the EU has granted some form of equivalence on financial services or on some financial services to, to US financial services. And there, there was a target date of, of the start of July to do that in these talks between the UK and EU. And, and both sides are sort of com complaining about the questions from, from the other side. So I, th I think we're looking at best at equivalence ra rather than literally passporting. Can, can I just make one other other comment while, while, while I'm here, as it were, uh, which relates partly to your previous comments, Mark, and also to, to what David was talking about earlier. Um, the, if the EU does come out stronger out of this crisis, I think it will also come out more integrated um, and of course, the UK always had quite a lot of problems with some of the EU's integration, not ironically with the single market, that actually was a, a, a 1980s uh, partly Thatcher government idea, but obviously we stayed out of the Schengen border free zone, we didn't join the Euro, uh, nervous on a common defence and so forth. So if the EU gets more integrated, is the UK going to be politically ready ever to rejoin? But I think it's also a serious question uh, for those who want independence in the EU, because the in pro-independence in the EU side have, have often tr tr trod very carefully around the question of the euro. Um, if, if the EU is getting more integrated, is that the sort of pro-European people we are are we going to be comfortable with that we have to talk about that um you know and 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 we have to i don't think trying to join an ever more integrating eu if we want to do a typical britain and be on the margins is is going to be a very comfortable place to be and it might even be one we wouldn't be allowed to be and for sure if, if the uk asked to rejoin in five years it certainly wouldn't be given the opt-outs we currently have yeah well, I think that's uh, on the last point, Kirsty. Yeah, uh, I mean, an issue we started off talking about financial services, but uh, on the on the last point, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if a, if a penitent, unlikely in the current conjuncture, UK were to uh, kind of uh, go cap in hand to Brussels and say, "Oh, sorry, we made a terrible error. We completely screwed up. The economy's gone down the toilet. Uh, we accept it's not just COVID; it's also Brexit. Oh God, God, we didn't realise at the time." You know. The, all the concessions which would be made would be would 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 no longer be offered. We won't be talking about a twenty great multi billion rebate. Absolutely no chance of that whatsoever. And what's more, I think the kind of rather kind of you know that I think they would expect a demand. I've certainly heard it a much more kind of openly enthusiastic uh, approach to European integration on the part of the Brits. And this 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 also affects Scotland, of course. You're right. I mean, as regards the euro, uh, I mean, I happen to be a kind of fan of it. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And I wish Britain had joined. I wish Tony Blair had had the guts to say to Gordon Brown, piss off, Gordon, you're wrong on this. We're going to go for it. When he had the prospects in 1997 forward. Anyway, that's a history. But say, uh, you know, I mean, some country, I mean, people sort of assume that it's, it's a given that you have to join the euro. Yes, in a way you have. But, and it, and it may well be that they are going to demand much greater, tougher conditions. Uh, I don't know, but at the moment, don't forget, Sweden joined in 1995. They're still using the Kroner. Uh, Denmark, of course, has got a lot tough. Uh, Poland joined in, a huge country, 45, 40 million people, you know, joined in 2004. They're still using the Zloty. Uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, you have to be kind of, um, sort of box clever about this, but I, but I certainly agree that there will be much, much greater integration. We are seriously, the, you know, the F word, federalism, is if only just creeping back onto the agenda. Okay, now there's a few questions which all have 
bear on different aspects of what how what kind of relations can Scotland have now, uh, perhaps a level of civic society, if not necessarily governmental level, or, you know, what, how we can have that kind of relationship. I'll, I'll, I'll go through all those questions so we can answer them in one go. So one question is, should we not encourage our local authorities to build up links and twinning arrangements? Um, can, we, um, can we make our wish to be as closely aligned as possible to the EU heard? Uh, and there was a question about um, what could Scotland do to maintain and boost links with the EU member states? Could we, for example, join the Nordic Union? So there's three different questions there, covering a lot of points. The Nordic Union, um, other links and local authorities. Uh, well, I'll start David. with that. Um, yeah, just briefly. Um, well, I mean, local authority, I mean, I think personally, yes, I think the, the, the stronger the links, the possible, the better. I mean, and these should be not just economic or political, but also cultural exchanges. I very much hope that some kind of arrangement can be made that, you know, that uh, Scottish, um, not just students, but also uh, apprentices and trainees can take, continue to take part in, in, in Erasmus+. Plus. Uh, which, is, which is absolutely vital, is one of the greatest things. And as I often say in these cases, in these occasions, Erasmus uh, is the brainchild of a Welsh, uh, former, very senior Welsh uh, EU official, and now, uh, I hasten to add, a very prominent member of, of Plaid Cymru, as, as it happened, Howell Kerry Jones, uh, and, um, and so on. So, yeah, and I think that, um, I think we have to, uh, and I think, I think we need to, get our, uh, you know, our political leadership and our, and the Scottish government in particular, we have these hubs, like for example in Berlin and Brussels, but I think, I think that the level of ambition, it seems to me, on the part of the Scottish government is too low. I mean, I think we're too modest, we're too sort of retiring. I think we need to step up the level of ambition and actually go for much stronger, closer links with with the, uh, with the with the European polity, and you know, and assert our, assert our right to be a full scale member of the sort of, if you want to put it this way, the kind of European political family. Kirsty. Um, yes, I mean, I, I agree with much of what David said. I mean, I think certainly there's there's lots to be done. Um, even though Brexit has happened and even though we're not heading to, towards a soft Brexit. Um, we're still European, we're still, a, we're still part of an island off, off the, the northwest shore of the continent. Um, and so whether it's local authorities or charities or businesses or unions or individuals or the cultural sector, there's going to be lots of things it won't be possible to do exactly as before. We'll, we'll find there's barriers in the way or we'll find that there's more hurdles or hoops we have to jump through. But there's not, there's not literally going to be a wall. So I think it's going to be very important, um, given the damage of Brexit, to, to try and keep, keep such links as we have and to, and to think of new ones and to think of new ways of working. So, I mean, as David said that, you know, there are hubs, Scottish government hubs within, mostly located within the British embassies in Berlin, Paris, Dublin, um, London, in fact, and, and the Scottish government Brussels office, which, which is very active um, in, in various ways from culture to, to monitoring the Brussels talks, uh, sorry, the Brexit talks. Um, and the Scottish government did actually, I, I wrote a piece a year ago saying, saying something a, a bit similar to what David said at the end, that, that there should be a more coherent, comprehensive Scottish government European strategy. But the Scottish government did produce quite an interesting, if, if short, let's say, uh, Scottish European strategy um, at, the start, at the start of this year. And so, so I think that was an important step in the right direction. I, I think it would also, uh, be interesting to look at where else some of these hubs could open could open up and you know some of you may well be sitting there saying yeah but foreign policy is reserved well yes foreign policy is reserved but not not every aspect of culture and economic and our ability to talk to and do do, do things positively with 
with our neighbours. So, so I think there is scope to do more. It's important to keep doing what the Scottish government has already at least been been doing. Um, it does it does take resources. Um, in terms of the the Nordic Union, I'm I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure on on what basis those countries meet, to be honest. I mean, if they meet in states rather than allowing in sub-states, that David looks like he wants to, he's going to come in on, on that one. Obviously, Scotland's already started to play uh, uh, or interact more with, with the Arctic countries. So, you know, I think some of, some of these things are, are already um, happening. Some of them need, need dreadful word, ramping, ramping up a bit. The Paris office, the Paris hub, for instance, is is very new and as David was saying earlier that you know the Franco-German relationship looks to be going into one of its stronger phases at the moment so how that Berlin and Paris hubs are used is going to be really important. I mean just uh, yeah I think you're right that the you can't you can't join the Nordic Union as a sub-state any more than you can join as far as I know any more than you can join the EU as a sub-state it's just not on. I mean I what I was trying to say earlier was that I just think you know the level of ambition is too is is too modest, as I say, and I think that you know we need to. I mean, Scotland needs to. Well, I'll say this because uh, it gets up my. You know, it really annoys me a lot. But um, although I've changed my view on Scottish independence, uh, uh, frankly, but a uh, we're a, we're far too obsessed with this constitutional naval gazing. We, I mean, you know, there should be within the Scottish political debate. And you can see this, for example, in the in the recovery plan, which the which the Betty Higgins and and and, and put out. There's barely a mention of Europe in it. It's all about it's all about pretty small scale kind of stuff, you know, uh, improving um, the kind of youth guarantee and a few other bits and bobs like that. I mean, it's not it's it completely lacks ambition. It's utterly unradical. It's deeply conservative. I think we need to get out there. And start talking to not 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 just you know not just liberals and not just social democrats but others as well. We need to get off. We really need to take part in the European debate. Otherwise, we're going to be left behind. There is an extraordinary big, very fruitful debate going on out there in in on the continent of Europe. And I I, I bitterly regret the fact that most of it never never gets into the kind of Scottish political debate at all. And it's about time it did. I think, well, we've had a couple I, of questions. Sorry, oh, Kirsty, Kirsty, go on, yes. yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add very briefly on that. I mean, we, we produced from, from the Scottish Central and European Relations last year a report on the future of Europe and a contribution from Scottish authors to that, including a chapter by, by David. And, and, and so I think, you know, that can be done, but we do need the wider policy community and the politicians to then pick it up and run with it and, and the post Brexit situation is it's harder to do that e even if people who are in Brussels or Berlin are well disposed to Scots because it was a remain country having a voice as a third country or part of a third country outside the EU and being listened to is harder but that, that's a reason to work more at it as David says not to not to just give give up and it, it does concern me how, how much different different reports on the economics and other aspects of independence don't take the the European angle in, into account enough. It's almost put in its own separate box about can we join the EU and how long will it take rather than how yeah. does it affect us today that we are part of the European economy. Yeah, and there was a, uh, a couple of people made comments about uh, what should the European movement be doing. Well, I think we've now got some ideas from what the two of you just said about issues we should be focusing and campaigning on. And we've got around 15 minutes left. I'm going to try and go through all the questions if I can. I think I'll probably just allocate them to one or other of the speakers and then we'll hopefully get through them that way as quickly as possible. Uh, does Scotland have the institutional capacity to simultaneously try to match rising EU standards, especially on greenery, presumably environmental matters, conduct a constitutional debate and recover from the pandemic. Right, one minute answer from uh, David. Well, I mean, you know, just think about what I said before. If it's got the ambition, if it has the will, yes, of course it has. This is, a, this is an extremely well-educated, well-endowed uh, country with plenty of intellectual firepower, if it so wishes to have it. And uh, it's really just a question of confidence, you know. I mean, it just needs to kind of raise its game, and you know, uh, we'll be playing in the Champions League. Right. 
Kirsty, a question. Some countries like Spain have a strong trade dependency on the UK. To what extent will it be possible for there to be direct country to country agreements? I think that means UK to an EU member state, which I think the answer is pretty clear, but Kirsty. Uh, well, ba basically not at all. Uh, tr trade policy sits um, with with the European Commission. It, it, it's 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 competence in the jargon. Um, there may be areas, you know, there's a, a lot of discussion ongoing in Brussels about completing the the single market for services or for digital services, and so up to the point if there are certain areas that aren't complete, there there may be a, a some some scope and and especially because uh migration is is a sort of mixed and shared competence between the eu and member states uh, because we are about to be shut out of some big parts of the single market for services businesses and individuals will find they have to go and look at the specific slovak criteria or the spanish criteria um and, and not uh, as well as the eu single market Criteria, but no, I don't. I don't think there's any separate. There's no separate deals to be done there. And and obviously, um, in t in terms of visas, for instance, for business or, or tourism or personal travel, you you you've got most of the countries are in the Schengen zone, so so they'll have a common visa system. Okay. A question uh, is. Is the uh, UK really wanting to have a no deal Brexit and this a Dominic Cummings aim? Um, well, that's certainly, it's certainly a view which is out there. I think, I think Kirsty has made a valiant effort to, in her talk to suggest that, uh, you know, a deal, maybe a pretty crap deal at that, is still on the table. I mean, there is, a, there is a, quite a strong sense that one picks up the feeling that precisely led by Cummings and, uh, and, and, uh, and Johnson to some extent, heavily influenced though, that no deal actually would suit the, uh, would suit the, would suit the, would suit a certain section of the, uh, the Brit Nat, you know, uh, vote leave government uh, rather well, actually. Yeah, I think, I think it's quite a, it's quite a strong kind of, uh, it's quite a strong view because then, you know, if they, if they have no deal, then they can, then they can, you know, they can, pursue their uh, vision of a kind of anglo spheric uh, you know this this kind of notion that somehow or other the world is going to be at their beck and you know outside europe but europe they create the impression that basically europe stinks and that you know everything else is wonderful so let them get on with it okay a few more questions uh what are the grounds for hope in our relationship with the EU and what could the European movement and our allies achieve for the next six months and the next five years? Well, I think uh, Dave has given us a few uh, indications of what uh, we could try and uh, aim for uh, at Scottish level and even at UK level. I mean, we have seen this government occasionally being prepared to move under pressure on some of the issues about, for example, the NHS health surcharge. So, I mean, as always, many issues, we don't campaign over anything. Uh, of course, for the next five years, there's very many possible political developments. Obviously, there's a whole independence debate. There will be a general election at the UK level uh, within the next uh, five years, or well, the next four and a half years now. So that certainly means a prospect for a different government, which may not uh, uh, go to join the EU, but it may mean a close relationship. It may mean, of course, the outcome of that election is one in which there's a the um, uh, balance of parties as such that rejoining the EU is on the agenda and obviously we want to see rejoining the EU being on the agenda uh, whether it's Scotland or the UK so you know there's lots we can do uh, and uh, I hope uh, today will give us some ideas of what, what should where that will take us um, and as someone's pointed out uh, the more people come disillusioned with Brexit then, and fail to win COVID, then uh, uh, many things could change very, very quickly. And on, could I just add briefly Kirsten, on that, yes, yeah. Mark? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's very hard to be positive and optimistic at the moment, given the damage the Brexit deal will, will do compared to where we are now. But this is probably, this is one of the reasons why it is important to even to get a, a weak, bad deal rather than no deal, which will make relations, political as well as economic relations, very difficult. Mm. And if there is a basic deal, there will be things that even the current government will have to 
to build on. It's not, it's not possible to set up all the sorts of possible collaborations you, you need, whether, whether it's on climate or, or services or security or other issues. It's not all, or transport, it's not all going to be done even if there is a deal. So there will be more talks and there will be things that, that may be added. So there's certainly going to be plenty to, to lobby for. And, and uh, you know, we were talking earlier about what happens in the US presidential elections. Um, and if, if, it, if it's Biden, maybe the UK will start to look very isolated. And, you, you know, will, will Johnson have to shift course, you know, if, if Cummings' advice leads us into a much more catastrophic economic uh, outcome from Brexit and COVID than the rest of Europe or even America, the political dynamics may may change. We also it, we need to see and hear more from Keir Starmer. He is the the leader of the largest opposition party, and he, he's clearly playing. You could say, um, if you put it nicely, uh, a long game here. But he didn't ask for an extension of the transition period, and he's trying to establish himself as a as a new opposition leader at some point. He has to say what sort of relationship he wants the UK <laughs> to have with the European Union. And he's clearly not going to say, well, he likes the deal that, that Johnson gets if he gets one. And, and at the moment, he's hanging back from that. We no longer have a Labour position of, of rejoining the EU's customs union, for instance. But he can't put that off forever. Uh, I quite agree with that. And at the moment, he seems to be very determined not to upset anybody in the what was once the uh, the, the labor w uh, red wall in uh, the northeast and northwest of england and and to some extent of the west in, in the midlands the english midlands uh, i mean i think scotland at the moment plays absolutely practically zero calculations with, within uh, a very limited very limited role within his calculations i mean our scottish interests uh, is certainly in terms of this in terms of, of um, certainly in terms of brexit Brexit is wholly deleterious to the, to the Scottish people and to the Scottish economy. There is nothing good that can be said about it whatsoever. And if Labour doesn't realise that, and I say this as a kind of very long-standing, I'm no longer a member of the Labour Party, uh, you know, it's going to take an even worse cupping than it has done in the last few years in elections here. Now, the last question we've got time for, uh, back, I think, to the things that Kirsten was just talking about. The question is, a soft deal would mean damage limitation, but how anyway will people be affected in everyday life? For example, food prices, availability of medicines. Uh, I suppose either uh, un under a soft Brexit, how much, we got, where are the areas we might lose out in particular? Um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're not heading for a soft Brexit, um, but the difference between a, a uh, a deal, the sort of deal Johnson is after, which is at least one without tariffs in most areas, will be different from one, the no deal, which means you'll be in a WTO, World Trade Organization, outcome. <clears throat> and so you'll be facing not only, uh, well, some sectors where tariffs will be noticeably higher, in, including a number of, of foodstuffs. But I think the other problem with, with supplies of food and medication even potentially in a, in a deal when it's at short notice, is there is going to be more customs bureaucracy. Even if you don't have a tariff, you may have to prove that the good was produced mainly in the UK and it's not being used as, as a route for countries like China or any other country to come into the UK with no tariffs and avoid European tariffs. And if there isn't enough time for, for ports and businesses and other operators to, to get organized for, for all this, then we'll be back to some of the same worrying discussions we had last year as to whether there's going to be some short-term problems as well as potentially medium-term higher prices. But I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the economic effects go much wider than that the, the, this is this is um you know the eu is is takes almost half the uk's trade we're putting up barriers that that will ensure that that trade becomes smaller than it would have been otherwise that our growth and our investment is lower than it would have been otherwise so there may be some specific areas where we see the effects um and and others where well, as we were saying earlier, you know, the government may try and, and blame lower growth on, on COVID. But if the UK comes out of COVID, hopefully next year, 
and then out of the customs union the single market and if we're doing so much worse than all the other european countries hopefully people are going to ask the right questions and come to the conclusion it's not just the mismanagement of covid and lockdown but it's it's also the folly of brexit thank you kirsty and uh, thank you david uh, i think that's been an excellent uh, session though excellent uh, speakers but well, thank you very much uh, the, the two of you thank you for i think around 40 q and questions and comments in the chat of which we covered quite a lot my final comment is to say i hope those of you who are uh, have uh, what we to realize we are not just as a new movement a talking shop we actually want to change things we were a campaign organization so at the end of this uh, uh, session you'll see in a minute i hope a slide come up which gives you uh, our contact details find out more about your peer movement, sign up to get information about what we do and uh, join us uh, as well. We rely upon volunteers to so join us and uh, here it is. Uh, thank you again for participating and uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thank you.